Today from the Global Lane, missionary Patrick brought Christianity to the Emerald Isle. 1400 years later, is Ireland losing its religion? We were very arrogant as a church. But a new church is rising and non-Irish are leading the way. New visa restrictions. Why Trump has added six more countries to the travel ban list. Bernie Sanders braces Cuba and Fidel Castro. What do college students think? And a parade of anti-Semitism on display in Europe for the whole world to see. And it's all right here on the Global Lane. Ireland was once a nation where almost everyone went to church. Now in parts of the country, almost no one does. So what happened? Dale heard reports from Dublin on Ireland's Christian legacy and why it isn't over yet. If there's a symbol of what happened to faith in Ireland, it might be this. The Church of the Annunciation just outside of Dublin. It's one of the largest church buildings in Ireland, and it's about to be knocked down because so few people attend services. Anyone in Ireland over 50 can still remember a nation where almost everyone went to church. But today, live in a nation where in some areas, almost no one goes to church. The Christian faith that has dominated Ireland for centuries died with surprising speed. And as one leader put it, today for the Irish, God has become irrelevant. They not only walked away from the church, they legalized same-sex marriage, abortion, and elected an openly gay prime minister. Nick Park heads Ireland's Evangelical Alliance. It was very much a cultural religion. Well, they were Catholic because they were Irish, and the two were seen as synonymous. We were very arrogant as a church. Patty Monaghan helps lead the Evangelical Catholic Initiative. Uh, sadly, it's taken the two referendums uh, that we both that lost, one on same-sex marriage, one on abortion, to bring home to the Catholic Church in Ireland that they're now a minority church. Church buildings abandoned, some Catholic seminaries almost empty. One clergyman wrote that the battle for faith in Ireland has been lost. But a new church is rising. This is the largest church in Ireland, and it is Romanian Pentecostal. The worshipers at Batania or Bethany Church came to Ireland to find work, but now realize they were sent to Ireland as missionaries. Batania Church is exploding. It's building a new five and a half million dollar facility on faith, one that will accommodate 1,500 worshipers. I met two of its pastors at the construction site. We're praying for this country. We're fasting for this country. And I think God has a plan with us to be a blessing for this country and more people to know God and to be saved in this country. Because God loves Ireland. Now we realized God has a greater plan, a bigger purpose for our lives to deliver his message and his kingdom works for this country. In fact, the second largest church in Ireland is also Romanian Pentecostal. Batania pastor Georgia remembers when nations like Ireland sent Bibles to communist Romania. And those Bibles are coming back now. African churches are also growing. The Nigerian Redeemed Christian Church of God has grown to more than 100 churches in Ireland with several thousand members. And even though most Irish have rejected the institutional church, Polls show many still believe the core of the gospel. Among Irish youth, uh, I think it's something like 70% of them said they really believed Jesus rose from the dead. They really believed in heaven and hell. They really believed that Jesus was the incarnate Son of God. So you still got these very high rates of belief in the facts of the gospel. When we were choked by religion uh, and institutionalism, there wasn't much life. But now that we have those institutions crumbling, I think that we're in the land of opportunity. Monaghan says the spirit is moving in some Catholic churches as well. I do know there's, there's a spiritual awakening happening in this country. And some parish priests are really becoming born again, filled with the Holy Spirit and getting a vision for what's possible. There's that spiritual heritage within this nation that I believe the enemy, Satan wants to destroy. But there's, I, I believe it's gonna happen again. Ireland, once a mission field, then a base for missions, has become a mission field again. Dale Hurd joins us now via Skype with more. Dale, how did Ireland leave the faith so quickly? 
Well, you know, they did studies uh, back when Ireland was very religious, and it showed that uh, the faith wasn't very deep. Ireland is about, you know, the Irish are about relationship and community, and I think the Catholic Church was a part of that. And then when these scandals just rocked the nation, terrible scandals involving children, you know, there was nothing to hold the Irish there. They were, they were through. Many debate whether Europe is really post-Christian because we're seeing great moves of God in many places. Is it post-Christian? Boy, you get a, get a room of uh, Christian leaders from Europe together and that'll start a fight. Um, there, there are great things are happening, as you say, but the culture has been lost. I mean, we're talking about nations that were completely Christian, more or less. And, and now, in many cases, almost no one goes to church. And so, you know, while God is moving, they've lost the culture. We have instances in nations like Britain that are in, officially Christian, persecuting Christians. And it's the only group that they pick on are Christians, and they're a Christian nation. And we have this all across Europe, the story of the Finnish member of parliament who faces prison for simply tweeting verses from Romans condemning homosexuality. And do you think this is going to get worse, Dale? What's the future of Christianity in Europe? I think persecution will get worse. There's nothing to keep Europe from persecuting Christians because it's unmoored from standards, you know, traditional standards of law. It's it's whatever, you know, makes it feel better, it does. And right now it sees Christianity as oppressive. But I believe in the Great Commission. I believe in the irrevocable calls of God on Europe and on many of these nations. And Europeans are empty spiritually. And so there is the, there's the turf there for a, a major mass revival, and many are praying for it. And what really stood out to me in your piece, I mean, many things, but uh, the fact that Bibles were sent from Ireland uh, to Romania during the Cold War, and now those Bibles are coming back. Not just the Bibles, but the missionaries. Yeah, and, and I'll be doing a story about this in, in the coming weeks on the 700 Club uh, next week, as a matter of fact. It, it's called The Great Reflex, and this was the prayer of early missionaries like William Carey and David Livingston, that the people of Africa and Asia from these mission fields would one day carry the gospel back to Europe. Well, it seems like now's the time and now's the day. Yeah. Dale, yeah. another excellent report. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Gary. And you can learn more about the origins of Ireland's Christian legacy just in time for St. Patrick's Day. CBN's film, I Am Patrick, hits the big screen for a two-night Fathom event, March 17th and 18th. Tickets are on sale right now. To see one man's journey from slave to saint, go to IamPatrick.com. Come home to the sounds of Southern Gospel from CBN Radio. You'll enjoy a rich Southern blend of bluegrass, classic gospel, and Southern gospel favorites like the Gaithers, the Crab Family, and bluegrass sounds like Mountain Faith. So make yourself at home with the all-new CBN Southern Gospel, now available at CBNRadio.com. Meet the pastors who are preaching the gospel in a fresh, fearless way. I'm Roberto Torres Cedillo. Join me each week for Next Gen Voices. And watch God transform a generation. thousands of years old. We were called to be a light to the world. Being fulfilled today. Discover how. Get to life. Call 1-800-700-7000. We consider it our duty to reach out and help others around the world. For a gift of $10 or more, you can own the acclaimed CBN documentary to life. Just call 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com. To treat a human, no matter what he is, which religious he have, which color he is, this is what I'm doing. See how the people of Israel are fulfilling prophecy. History is being written, and I want to be a part of it. By sharing their knowledge. In Africa, in Asia, in South America, in East Europe. And their love. This is how we work. This is us. 
Get to life. Call 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com. The Trump administration has just imposed new U.S. immigration restrictions on an additional six countries. Restrictions are now in place for visa applicants in Nigeria, Tanzania, Eritrea, Sudan, Kyrgyzstan, and Myanmar. That's also known as Burma. Up until now, travel bans were limited to people from Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria, Yemen, North Korea, and Venezuela. In June 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the president does have the authority to do that, to impose immigration restrictions based on national security concerns. We'll hear with more from Beirut, Lebanon, is U.S. diplomat George Farag. Dr. Farag served as a counselor officer at several high-risk U.S. embassies. He's author of the new book, Pro-American Immigration, Common Ground in Our Immigration Strategy. Dr. Farag, good to have you with us all the way from Beirut. So why did the president add more countries to the so-called travel ban list? Well, Gary, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, when you listen to the, the mainstream media, it's, uh, it's, it's simply a matter of racism, uh, bigotry, and separating families. But I don't believe that. In my mind, uh, the travel ban is, is a tool used by the United States government and other governments as a, as for, di for diplomatic purposes in order to push political objectives. Let's look at Syria, for example. Syria has been ravaged by years of civil war and, um, and, and, and different, different terrorist groups. We find that the security posture in Syria does not allow for the Syrians and the, and the Americans to have an exchange for security or uh, information purposes. So it makes sense that there would be a full travel ban in Syria. If we look at Iran, the situation is a little bit different. The, the, the relationship has also been quite shaky for the past 40 years. We've used different diplomatic tools such as sanctions, military strikes. But at the same time, the president has constantly left the door open for a new Iran deal. And I think it's not a coincidence that the door is open for students to get visas to come to the U.S. The last example is in Nigeria. Nigeria is an ally of the United States. Uh, it's one of our major trading partners. But we also have uh, an issue in Nigeria, which is Boko Haram, another terrorist group. There is a travel ban in Nigeria, but it's only for immigrant visas. George, I've done a lot of international traveling over the past 25 years. I've often heard from Christians in places like Egypt, Pakistan, Syria, Iraq, that they have faced discrimination in the visa application process. The Muslims in those countries have been treated much more favorably over the years in gaining approval to enter the U.S. So is that policy changing? Gary, I cannot say it's a policy. As a former consular officer, I can I can tell you that uh, the American consular officer does not discriminate based on religion. Uh, so while folks may feel that way, uh, the reality in terms of the actual decision-making process by consular officers at embassies is we we make decisions on cases based on the merit of the case, not based on the religion of the um, of the applicant. Now, while President Trump promised to increase the number of Christian refugees allowed into the United States, a Cato Institute study found Christian refugee admissions during President Trump's first two years actually dropped 50 percent lower than during President Obama's presidency. I guess Muslim admissions also been down under Trump by about 72 percent. But why are we not allowing more persecuted Christians into the United States? Well, I think it's uh, it's more a matter of the, um, the the workload at the embassies. So it's uh, again, I don't want to say it's Christian versus Muslim, but rather you know qualified applicants versus unqualified applicants. I've talked to a number of national security and immigration uh, experts on this show who have said potential Middle East terrorists have entered into our country illegally on the U.S. southern border with Mexico. So, what should we do about that, George? I think this is one of the priorities of this administration, which is to secure the borders. And, uh, and a lot is being done on that front. We need to continue uh, with the vetting process. We need to continue with various forms of border security. I think that uh, we're moving in a good direction. But certainly, I think this administration would agree that uh, we need to do as much as we can to make sure that the folks who are entering the United States are friendly to the United States, but in addition to that, qualified to enter the United States. 
So the law of the United States is that to come to America as an immigrant, you have to be able to demonstrate that you will not be public charge or somebody who depends on public welfare programs. You can do this by having a sponsor, somebody from the United States, an American or a legal permanent resident, sponsor your, uh, your application financially to make sure that you're financially cared for while you're in the U.S. And the Trump rule is just going a step further with that. So I think by having rules that are really consistent with the laws, we're taking good steps to securing the country. Because this is one of the things in, in, in my book uh, is based on this, whereas if we have rules that are not consistent with the laws, there creates gaps, and those gaps can be manipulated. Okay, it's all about enforcing the rules on the book. And your book is Pro-American Immigration, Common Ground in Our Immigration Strategy. Dr. George Fadag, thanks for sharing your time and insights. Too often, we carry baggage from our past. You know what it's like. It affects everything and everyone in our lives. It's always there, weighing us down and keeping us from achieving true happiness. But do you know God never meant for us to be trapped in the past? You can be free of your baggage. Learn how God's forgiveness leads to changed lives and new beginnings. Call the 700 Club. I'm Ephraim Graham, and this is Studio 5. Cruise with me as I discover the good things happening in the world of music, sports, television, and movies. The fact that Ryan Coogler was going to be directing the film, I knew that something special was going to happen. We'll chat with artists at the forefront of entertainment and explore the connection between popular culture and faith. I asked my pastor, I said, well, does that mean I'm supposed to be a preacher? He says, well, no, you already have a pulpit. Watch Studio 5, Wednesday night at 9.30. Kun Olam. This is our nature as a country. To make the world a better place. Literally, we felt the earth shaking. The Christian Broadcasting Network presents To Life, how Israeli volunteers are changing the world. This film needs to be seen by everyone. I was in tears. Now you can own the inspiring documentary To Life on DVD. There is blood on our hands if we know and we walk away. I'm so grateful that this film was made. To Life can be yours for a gift of $10 or more. Call 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com. We know that every minute counts to save life. It'll uh, bless Israel, but it'll also bless all the friends of Israel. Discover the untold story of how Israeli volunteers are making the world a better place. Call 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com to get your copy today. Democratic presidential candidate socialist Bernie Sanders is on a roll. If he wins the majority of the Super Tuesday states March 3rd, he'll be on course to win the party's nomination. The Democratic Party establishment is in a tizzy. How could this happen? A socialist? Well, our college-age voters, those attracted by promises of free college tuition, health care for all, and a higher minimum wage, giving Sanders the, the election edge? Well, here to set us straight is Eduardo Naret, digital reporter for Campus Reform. Eduardo, it's good to see you again. So I know you talked to some college students about comments that Bernie Sanders made to 60 Minutes recently about Fidel Castro. So where were you? And explain what you said to the students. I went to the University of Maryland because I wanted to see if students had seen what Bernie said. But the interesting thing is I didn't tell them that he said it. So I presented students with his quotes from 60 Minutes and I said, which politician do you think said this? Here's what they said. Which politician do you think made this remark? <sighs> I'm going to make the assumption that it was Trump. Um, Trump? I'm just going to go with Trump. Sounds like something he would do. Sure. I mean, it just sounds like uh, something that came from... Trump himself. I wouldn't expect a Democratic candidate to say something like this. Um, so if I had to guess, it would be a Republican candidate. So I'm just going to guess Trump. Eduardo, they just don't seem to understand that Cuba is a communist dictatorship supported by many liberals and leftists, and it's praised by many college professors. But still, I'm assuming that most college students don't really support socialism once they dig a little deeper and discover what's it's really about during the time of the Soviet Union or today in Venezuela, correct? 
That is certainly one of the takeaways from this video. So a lot of students, as we've reported on here at the Leadership Institute's campus reform, across the country have, have embraced socialism, had said they favor socialism. Bernie Sanders does very well with young college students. But when I told them, and when you tell a lot of these students what socialism really is, how destructive it really is. So when I said, you know, these comments that Bernie made about Cuba, this is an oppressive regime that has, has killed people, oppressed people, they sort of take a step back and they're a little bit shocked that, that that's what socialism is. So I think it's, it's very interesting to see how they think they support the policies of socialism, but when presented with the evils and the facts behind it, they're not as quick to embrace it, which I think is a very important thing that a lot of your viewers and, and the rest of the country need to know that if we want to prevent socialism on campuses, it's important to talk to students, to talk to people out there about what it really is. So are they voting for Bernie regardless because he's promising them lots of free stuff? You know, there is a large section of the student population across the country that is supporting Bernie Sanders. A lot of it is because of, like you said, free stuff. So I talk to students uh, across the country, and a lot of the times they tell me they like Bernie Sanders' free college uh, loan program of debt forgiveness. They talk about free Medicare for all. I, I often point out to them, I say, you know, you're going to have to pay for this. Your taxes are going to go up. Your friends and family's taxes are going to go up. And, and that's another example of where they step back and they say, you know, I, I'm not sure if they support that. What I also want to point out is in this video, you, you see that a lot of students want to be moderate. There, there is a moderate lane here among young students on campus. Again, they don't necessarily know what Bernie Sanders' socialism is. But when you point it out to them, they, they told me in the video, you know, he is too socialist for me. He is too extreme. So I think there is an opportunity here for Republican or Democratic candidates to come in, explain what socialism really is. And I think there are a lot of students on campus who, who are moderate and who will listen to someone who presents them with the facts of what uh, socialism can cause. Now, beyond Bernie, I was surprised to discover that many college students actually credit Barack Obama for the economic successes we're enjoying under President Trump. Tell us what you found out about that. So with President Obama tweeting last week that, you know, he felt he deserved credit for the economy and with President Trump responding, again, I wanted to see what students thought about the issue. And not surprisingly, they gave credit to President Obama. I think this speaks to the liberal bias we see on campus, not only in, in Bernie's 60 Minutes video that we talked about before, but in this video as well. And, and let me explain why. So when you're a student on campus, you're going to class every day around uh, professors who aren't just liberal Democrats, but they also bash Republicans in the classroom. So at Campus Reform, we report on how professors have attacked President Trump, have attacked Republicans, and, and really called them things like evil. And, and so when you hear every day that Republicans are bad people, when they're evil, and then you hear of some of the good things going on in the country, you're not going to give credit to Republicans for that. But as you know, uh, the Obama recovery was the slowest recovery in history. I pointed out to these students, you know, what about President Trump's tax cuts? What about the fact that he's cut regulations? Some of them just looked at me with a blank stare, or they went back to their original point of, well, we still feel like President Trump built that on the back of Obama. One student even said, you know, in her heart, she wanted to give credit to the Obama. And again, this speaks to a trend that we're seeing among this new generation where feelings are more important than facts. That's why I like to go to campuses and talk to students about the facts to get their real reactions and see if they're willing to change their minds once the facts are presented. Okay, Eduardo Noret, uh, keep it up. We appreciate you. Campus Reform's digital reporter, thanks for the update. Thanks for having me. It's the new Superbook Bible app. It's packed with games, activities, and Superbook episodes that you can watch for free. Oh, no! There's trivia, a fun daily devotional, and answers to your Bible questions. Plus, an easy-to-understand Bible the whole family will enjoy. You can even create your own Superbook character. Ta-da! It's the new Superbook Bible app. Free downloads on iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon. From Washington, D.C., uncompromising stories, interviews, and analysis from veteran journalists David Brody, Escalating fight. Jenna Browder, Knows his words carefully. Ben Kennedy, Plan to join him. And Amber Strong, For impeachment grows a little bit louder. Bringing you the political news that matters. We get out and tell the story of the progress that we're making in this country. Watch Faith Nation, weeknights at 6 on the CBN News Channel. We will move the American Embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. As the nations rage, 
you can stand with Israel. History is being written, and I want to be a part of it. Call 1-800-700-7000 and get to life. This is our nature as a country. Discover the untold story of how Israeli volunteers are changing the world. We consider it our duty to reach out and help others around the world. For a gift of $10 or more, you can own the acclaimed CBN documentary, To Life. To treat a human, no matter what he is, which religious he has, have, which color he is. This is what I'm doing. Support Israel in their time of need. Get to life. Now available on DVD. Call 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com. And I wish that other people throughout the world could see this side of Israel. How much longer must Jews tolerate blatant anti-Semitism? I'm talking about anti-Semitic stereotypes that fan the flames of hatred and violent acts against Jews worldwide. For the second year in a row in Belgium, anti-Jewish caricatures and depictions were featured at the carnival in the city of Alst. The townsfolk will tell you, oh, it was just all in good fun. People were laughing at Brexit, the Belgian royals, Christians, Muslims, Jews, everyone. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't think depicting Hasidic Jews as ants is funny. They were pushing a mock-up of the Wailing Wall, Jerusalem's holiest site for faithful Jews. In Flemish, it was called the Ant Wall. Jews were singled out. They were targeted for this pre-planned, cruel, stereotypical attack. Now, how about this float that showed hook-nosed Jews seeing no evil, hearing no evil, speaking no evil, with gold bricks at their feet? All in good fun, right? Well, try doing the same to Muslims. See how Islamic extremists would respond. Last year, an all parade float featured a Nazi-style depiction of greedy Jews sitting on a pile of money. One had a rat on his shoulder. In 2013, a float showed a Nazi railroad car carrying Jews to a death camp. All in good fun? Right. The blatant anti-Semitism caused UNESCO to remove the Alst Carnival from the UN's cultural heritage list. This is what a UNESCO spokeswoman said after that decision last year. We really regret very deeply that the community of Alst has not addressed this issue, but we hope that this decision will help them, at least in, in the mid or long term, to address this issue appropriately. But guess what? It hasn't made a difference because anti-Jewish displays continued this year. In Germany, violent attacks have doubled. Last year, this Jewish man said he feared wearing a kippah, that's a Jewish skull cap on his head. Remember, this is not in Saudi Arabia or Iran. This is happening right in Europe. And me, myself, I wouldn't wear a kippah. It's, unfortunately, it's not safe. Maybe I hope that it will be safe in future, or maybe it was safe in the past, but right now, in 2019, no, it's not safe at all. Are we reverting back to the 1930s, just 75 years after Auschwitz? Folks, this anti-Semitism needs to end, and Christians must speak up. We cannot remain silent. Let's remember the words of the late Lutheran pastor, Martin Niemöller, who in 1946 said succinctly, First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out, because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out, because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Well, that's it today from the Global Lane. Be sure to follow us on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. And until next time, be blessed.